mankind and the elements. For some, it's an uncomfortable bond. When the thunderstorms came, I thought it was actually over. For others, when weather strikes, inspiration begins. These little things are revelations about the universe. These are the people who challenge nature, seek out its limits, reveal its secrets, and embrace its awesome power. In this episode, we'll meet an ambitious photographer determined to capture the heart of the storm. What I like about shooting weather is you won't get the same picture twice. A man exploring the depths of the earth who hopes to one day reach distant moons. How could you not find satisfaction in solving those curious problems? And a team of elite sailors on a mission to shatter a historic record. This is man against ocean. This is man against the elements. These pioneers of the great outdoors ahead on That's Amazing. When dangerous storms approach, most people flee. Not 21-year-old Jonas Piantek. His popular lightning photographs result from staying put in the face of certain danger. Lake Maracaibo and the Catatumbo storms is one of the greatest experiences you will ever get. Sitting here at night watching the stars with continuous lightning flashing all around you, getting hit by some really strong storms, the thunder, the lightning, that's what makes this place so special for me. Lake Maracaibo, Venezuela is the lightning capital of the world, where locals know the near daily phenomena as the never-ending storm. The menacing atmosphere ignites Piantec's passion and creativity. Electrified, he snaps away, striving to capture the weather's beauty one flash at a time. I started with photography in 2011 when I found out that my dad has a very good camera. So I just grabbed it, went outside and shot everything. My interest in weather started the same year uh, as my interest started in photography when a tornado ravaged parts of, of a town close to my hometown. I started to search for, for pictures and found some people out of my city that are actually hunting for storms, that are chasing those storms. And I started riding along with them, seeing and experiencing everything they were experiencing. Jonas is a surprising young man. That was one cool storm. I just love these bolts shooting down. That is cool. His ability as a photographer and the way he's centered for his age is pretty impressive. Being published in great magazines such as the New York Times is a great feeling for me because I think people acknowledge my work and people like my work. And what I like about shooting weather is you won't get the same picture twice. The weather is changing so quickly, especially when you have storms out there, that you basically have one chance to get the picture you want. Jonas has been captured by something very similar that I was captured by more than 20 years ago. It's an enormous passion for what happens here Lake Maracaibo is a place that not many people have traveled to yet. Such an amazing combination of wildlife, of culture, and of course, this spectacular phenomenon of lightning. This is probably my favorite place on this planet. The Catatumbo lightning is like a creature. It's something that appears every night. Actually, just 30 kilometers in that direction is the one point on Earth with most lightning strikes. These lightning strikes reach 250 per square kilometer per year. You have to treat lightning with respect and you have to consider if a storm is far enough away to actually get the shots you want. When the storm starts closing in, you have to decide if you should move in and take shelter. The weather shifts in just half a minute. Generally, the storm is not only the lightning, it's also sometimes hurricane force winds, tornadoes, all sorts of formations of clouds and very heavy rain. One could describe this place turns to hell at night for some people. Of course, it's amazing for me, but there's so much lightning, so much storms around. Lightning is the pure force of nature. It's something that is actually dangerous, but beautiful together. This lightning phenomenon here is just the perfect topography. It's an enormous body of very, very warm water, approximately 16, 17,000 kilometers of warm, very low-lying water, and it's totally surrounded by mountains. On this map here, you can actually see by satellite the image of the storms forming. Yeah. And you have the Andes almost going around the whole lake. 
and they will start pushing down the cold wind at night towards the lake, which creates this special atmospheric condition to actually produce extremely intense lightning storms. The biggest challenge of shooting lightning is to decide which aperture you're going to use. You have to do your best to actually capture this whole experience at once, but you will never really get the full thing captured. Capturing weather and capturing storms especially is a great feeling because I can share with the world what I'm experiencing as a traveler, as a storm chaser, and as someone who, who puts himself in, into this danger to get the pictures and the experience I want. It's just something that humanity can't influence and you will feel very, very small when you're in front of a huge storm and that's the best feeling for me that I can possibly get. Aliens, jellyfish, bursting suns, that all is immaterial to me. I don't really want them to be like anything. I want them to be like nothing else you've seen before. My name is Anthony Howe. I'm a kinetic wind sculptor residing on Orcas Island, Washington. The unifying element to all of my work is that the outdoor stuff is all powered by the wind. The wind is attractive because it, it's, it's always there. It's not taking anything away from anything else. And it, the fact that it can be used to make a three-dimensional object move is perfect for me. I don't have a gallery and haven't had one for about 30 years. My wife and I have run the whole business ourselves without agents or galleries or consultants. Most of the people that see my work see it on YouTube videos. A large scale piece will generally start at say 45,000, 50,000 and go up to uh, 400,000 if it's a really big sculpture. But that's a kind of a piece that takes a long time to make and extracts a lot of physical ability out of me. What I'm trying to do with the work is cause people to stop whatever thought process they have in their head and just for a moment experience a different kind of reality, maybe more meditative. They work, they take people out of there, whatever nonsense is going on in their heads, puts them in a different place. It's a feeling you get when you see something that is very beautiful or unusual. That's what I'm trying to do with the work. In 2013, entrepreneur Jim Clark envisioned a boat built purely for speed. A boat so light, so fast, that it would shatter every record it attempts. In 2014, that dream became a reality with the 100-foot monohull Comanche. It's by almost any measure the fastest monohull in the world. With her revolutionary design, she has since been dominating the world of professional sailing, blowing competitors out of the water. Now, skipper Ken Reed is on a mission to break one of the sport's most prestigious records, the transatlantic record. It's one of the holy grails of ocean-going records. A grueling journey of 2,880 nautical miles from New York to the southern tip of England. Three or four you know, icebergs in that area. The crew's success depends largely on how elite navigator Stan Honey can predict, harness, and adapt to the Atlantic's fickle weather patterns. If broken, this record will secure Comanche's position as one of the most successful racing boats in sailing history. The build team that we assembled are the best of the best. There was no expense spared in creating this thing. It's either carbon or titanium. Carbon fiber sails, mast, everything. 
It's just making for boats that go significantly faster than they have in the past. Kenny Reed is the skipper, and Kenny couldn't have been more clear at what they wanted to build, a boat that would be as fast as possible, a boat that was legal to enter the major yacht races around the world, and to ideally set the course records for these events. Ultimately, what I'm pretty good at doing is getting a compatible group of all-stars from all around the globe that can actually handle a boat like this. It's like a Formula One car. You let it get away from you, it'll get away from you. It is a very dangerous boat. Everybody who's on board this boat either has America's Cup, Volvo Ocean Race, Grand Prix high-end racing background. It's their career, it's their job. The boat's a 100-foot screaming machine that has been built to break every record in the world that we can, and she's on her way to doing that. Once in the water, Comanche immediately began breaking records. We just got to go out and sail well and uh, let the chips fall. I think it's fair to say we got the fastest 100-footer in the world. With wind in their sails, the Comanche team set their sights on sailing's most prestigious prize, the transatlantic record. Stan Honey is a legend in our sport. When you think of all the great navigators, Stan is one of those guys right at the top of the list who comes to mind. The amount of work that he puts into it to make these attempts happen, without him, it wouldn't happen. So the uh, transatlantic monohull record is probably the most prestigious sailing record of any. The current project we're setting out to do is to try to set the monohull record for the fastest transatlantic passage. Um, that record is currently set at 6 days, 17 hours by Marishak. This record is, first of all, all about weather, and it's putting the boat in just ahead of harm's way. The conditions where the boat really excels is where it's windy. We've been watching the weather for months. We're looking for a front that's going to be coming off of North America. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of wind. We don't need a lot of wind to make this boat go fast. Since 2004, there tends to be four or five good weather windows where Comanche could have substantially improved on the record, meaning taken 18 hours or more off of the record. What I always do is to choose to sail a course that's longer than a great circle because of the expected benefit. So you'll get there sooner because of the predictions of the weather. You can't take the ocean for granted. This is man against ocean. This is man against the elements. If I've learned anything, you start to just get a little cocky in the ocean and it'll bite you hard. For Ken, it just came at a period where he had a prior commitment with the America's Cup, but that's the nature of weather. I was my pants to start with. <laughs> to be able to be told that, hey, you're going to be the guy in charge, and I was really, really happy to be in that position and, and trusted like that. Uh, Casey in the pit, Nick Dana at the rig. The transatlantic was a very interesting one for us because uh, we had three false starts. You're waiting for that exact window and you have to be ready at any moment, so your life's pretty much on hold. At this point, we're not that confident that this was actually the one. We are getting constant information from Stan. We want to start as close as we can to the front, but ahead of the thunderstorms, because if the thunderstorms catch it, you guys know what happened. It's a little bit of a feeling of, is this going to happen? It felt like a, a bit like launch day for NASA. And then when we pushed off the dock and started motoring out, that's when it really was like, wow, we're doing it. We're going to go. It's real. It's happening. We positioned ourselves about a mile away from the Ambrose Light. 
which gives us enough runway to hit the start line at full speed. We had the sail combination that we wanted to use. We had the perfect wind. It was time to let it rip. The acceleration, doing 25 knots to 30 knots. 20. Perfect, guys. Doing that <laughs> jump in such a short amount of time can often put you on your butt. Copy. 1658, 16. And we come past the Ambrose light, fully lit up. It was, uh, everyone gave a huge hoot and holler as we went past the start line, and off we went. July 22nd, Team Comanche is off like a rocket, sailing from New York City toward the tip of England determined to crush the transatlantic record. The record time that we're trying to beat is six days, 18 hours, and we're hoping to take a good 24 hours off that record. And it's pretty radical. You've got all the sail area up, you've got all the power in the world you need. So, you know, for a start, you don't want to mess it up. But just as they're off, things take a dangerous turn as Comanche tangles with a formidable thunderstorm. The worst part of it, the most dangerous part weather-wise, was actually the first night and that next morning. We started ahead of a front and the thunderstorms uh, preceding the front came out earlier than expected and kind of gobbled us up. I thought it was over. When the thunderstorms came, I thought it was actually over. We definitely had to sail a course that we weren't expecting to sail, and the first thing in my mind is, are we sailing home and going on standby again? And we managed to just wiggle our way out of it and, uh, and keep on going. Being on board Comanche in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean is something that you realise how small you are out there. Personally, I love the silence. You have a lot of time to think when you're out there. The day slows down a lot. You're living every hour. It's kind of cool to just disconnect and you're out there in the elements, the wind and the waves. It's nothing like it, it's crazy. Things move differently compared to other keelboats I've sailed on. One minute you're doing 10 miles an hour and then next you blink and honestly, you're up to 20 to 30 miles an hour. We've got 18 guys on board, and it's uh, for five and a half days. So it's pretty tight quarters, even though it is a 100-foot boat. You're sharing bunks, sharing bowls, you're sharing water bottles for tr drinking and everything. We are the two groups of eight. We do a four-hour on, four-hour off system. If you're working the sails, you're grinding, you're steering, you're always sort of losing Losing, losing, losing against the, the sleep. There's no place I'd rather be, even though it's a terrible place in a lot of respects. Oh, I wish I had new boots. <laughs> okay, guys, there's nice contours we're keeping track of. You've got to watch what's going on out here, though. There's a bit of fog around. You couldn't see more than uh, 100 feet in front of the boat. Uh, fully engulfed in fog. You know, doing 20 knots, uh, 100 feet isn't enough warning to avoid the ice. We are still in the vicinity of ice, so we have to be cautious. A real nervous time for the crew, and it's, it's hard, to be fair, it's hard to sleep. We knew we were on the pace. We knew that the time was right. But it wasn't until seeing England and having the wind there as we got close that it sunk in that it was like, wow, we're going to do this. We got very, very lucky with our weather window. And Stan refers to it as the postage stamp of, uh, of wind to carry across. Essentially, we had crushed the record. Now, hey! hey! This boat was built to do that. It did it. We're all very happy. It's such a special thing to be able to break this transatlantic record. 
huge thanks to the weather gods to allow us to do it as well, because uh, that's what it really took. Is there anybody else out there besides us? Why should we be interested in finding life elsewhere? These are the questions raised by Dr. Bill Stone, explorer, caver, inventor of a new class of robot called cryobots. There are a number of moons out there called ocean worlds. Stone is building his cryobots with NASA for unmanned exploration in space, nearly 400 million miles from Earth. There's a reasonable chance that we could find microbial life in those oceans. Simple-celled, single-celled, multi-celled creatures. Could that exist on other worlds? The team he's assembled spends years testing these robots in Earth's most extreme environments. Try to take science fiction and turn it into science fact. By the time their trip is scheduled, his cryobots will be ready to search for life across the galaxy. I was 14 when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon. The surface appears to be very fine grain. I wanted to be just like those guys. I, I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to go to the moon and beyond. I went through college, grad school, and, and a PhD program thinking all along that I was going to join the astronaut corps and we were going to go back to the moon. I was not selected. I was told I was too independent. <laughs> Which. But that's okay because I've since gone on to do work uh, related to private space exploration and exploration here on Earth in very deep caves. Some of our crews have been to the deepest places inside this planet that anybody has ever been. And distances so remote that it takes more time to get there than it would to get to the moon by rocket. So to me, that's kind of where I really find life. Everything else in between is just preparing for that. I founded Stone Aerospace about 15 years ago with the idea of putting together a collection of very talented individuals who could take on difficult scientific problems and turn them into reality. A lot of the stuff that we do involves expeditionary type work to places where it's difficult to get to and requires technology to do things there. Europa is one of the Galilean moons of Jupiter. It is entirely covered with ice, and that ice is over an ocean of significant depth. To me, it's a very interesting philosophical question. You know, is there life other than Earth? And here's a chance within our lifetime to prove it one way or another. The best place that we can get on Earth right now that is kind of like Europa is the Antarctic ice shelf. That has depths of ice of up to 4,000 meters uh, over subglacial lakes. If we could build a device that would go through 4,000 meters of ice in Antarctica, we would be paving the way to enabling a Europa mission. A cryobot is a general term for uh, what some people would refer to as a, a melt probe or a, an ice penetrator. This is Valkyrie. This is the world's first laser-powered cryobot. This entire thing right here is a closed cycle hot water drill. The purpose of a cryobot is to get through the ice, but once you get there, what do you do? Well, the idea is to deliver an autonomous underwater vehicle that goes looking for life. Artemis is a, a hovering autonomous underwater vehicle. It was built to test ideas for how to explore long ranges under uh, an ice cap and to investigate ways in which you would look for life in environments like that. 
We've been to Antarctica three times now. I've spent almost a year there uh, with our crews. There is a really large suite of scientific sensors on this vehicle, everything from five high definition cameras to water uh, collection systems. We can measure ocean currents. So I'm getting a line that way. And we can tell with tracking antennas where the vehicle is moving below the ice cap, even if it's hundreds of meters below the ice. This is the first one in which we've had a vehicle where you drill through an ice cap and then send it off for long distances on its own and have it come back and actually dock, latch, and be automatically uh, pulled to the surface. So this is really a, a, a prototype for a long-range Europa sub-ice uh, carrier vehicle, what we would refer to as the mothership, something that would be able to create topographical maps of the core of, of Europa, for example. It requires onboard intelligence at a level which we have never deployed yet, not even, for example, with Curiosity on Mars right now. So the robots will have to be much more independent than they are today, and they will have very specific roles in what they need to do. Could we pull off a Europa mission to the subsurface ocean? Answer is absolutely yes, 100% yes. I believe that it is launchable within 10 years if the money was on the table today. There's two things I think that drive us. One is the pursuit of happiness, and the second one is the pursuit of curiosity. If Galileo had not been interested in the motions of planets, or Copernicus, or Kepler, who would have provided the information that allowed Newton to figure out the law of gravitation? These little things are revelations about the universe, about us, our place in it. How could you not find satisfaction in solving those curious problems? To play the instrument that is utilizing our gentle Earth, it's like you are becoming one with the instrument in a very true way. You just sit and go, yes. We're looking at the great stalag pipe organ of the Luray Caverns in Luray, Virginia. When I press a key, it sends an electrical pulse up to a rubber-tipped mallet which strikes the stalactite, causing it to vibrate and producing a incredibly beautiful musical tone. The area that the strikers cover is roughly three and a half acres, which then makes it literally the world's largest musical instrument. It is a very gentle sound, um, very peaceful. There's only one like it in the world, and it's something incredibly different and wonderfully beautiful. They look like something out of an Indiana Jones movie. Bridges made out of living trees. This is Nangriat, a remote village in northeastern India, where locals have been growing bridges for hundreds of years. This part of the world is one of the wettest on Earth. The trees these bridges are made from thrive in the thick tropical forest and do not rot in the rain, making them strong enough to last generations. That's Winston Mua, the head of the village. He's lived here his whole life, since 
kita kan just start ini ni riu temen suaki dat padat ini ni tiga ratus ini ni ni jeri kan ya tiga ribu ini ni jengking haman lagi dua dijaga kita pendon kam kayak kaya yang berkam besok mana yang lihat dan di lecet kita lec beri lecnya. To get the roots to grow in a bridge across the water, they use wire and old tree trunks to guide their path. The hapal dangrit mangga kan ni kena dulu pa. Empat long yai kim yai ni kan yai dangrit. Tangan ladap hendu pusau senen. Jika ni kencing kim buat di untuk ke bah ar kena long yai. Jadi mata sak enam kan ni kan. Kita ngeri dan hang ni. Jangan dengan ikan senang, agak balap penpau, bersibun, beri nak keleng saudong, berlawan ban, cungok kai ban pek kai kan ikan jengking, nak ban pek juga bah sadin ni, ban bersup ini pun bersing. Snow means something different to everyone. Snow takes all the complicated details and simplifies the landscape, the possibilities of uh, naturally occurring sculpture. For snow globe artists Walter Martin and Paloma Munoz, snow is what draws you into their surreal world. There's like a paradise feeling where man and beast live in peace and work together to do the laundry. Here, they work out ambitions and exercise anxiety. Teetering is a te sense of teetering and of tenuous balance. The globes freeze miniature landscapes in wintry wonder, twisted logic, and macabre humor. It's like our own little form of poetry. Inspired by nature and the elements. We feel a lot of angst and dread uh, sometimes in the winter, and um, whew, it goes into the globe. The couple puts a modern twist on an age-old craft transforming knickknacks into custom works of art. So imagine a world full of stories and the camera goes in and just picks up this little fragment in time and a little moment. And that's what the globes are. They're samples of a larger world, but becomes alive when you shake it. Working together for us is one experiment, maybe like a marriage, but it's a more complex marriage because we're trying to create art together. We've been doing the snow globes now for almost 15 years. We started in 2001, that was when we made the first one. And we had no idea we were going to be making snow globes 15 years later. Everything starts with a small canvas that is the space that you have to fill in the globe. And then you start adding figures and you continue to explore the landscape in relationship to those figures. I think I was fascinated with the way that snow kind of takes all the complicated details and simplifies the landscape, uh, the unification of the landscape. It tends to be a great equalizer. And when there's something outside of that world that's interjected into it, like a human with a colorful wardrobe, or an animal, or a small house, or anything that's not of that world becomes a focus. It is a frozen world. We live at the edge of a small town, and on the other side of our house is Northeastern American forest. It's complete wilderness. And we walk it every day. And we love it. Depending on the day and the time of year and the time of day and the weather, uh, the forest can offer a totally different face. 
It's like we have one foot in the wilderness and one foot in civilization. We can bring those worlds together through our work. We say a lot of silly things throughout the day. It, it leaches into the work. I'm from Norfolk, Virginia, which is a flat coastal city in the Mid-Atlantic region, not known for its snowstorms. So I fantasized about escaping to a place where there was snow. For me, the challenge is always how to make something that is relevant, that contributes something to the conversation of what art is and what being a human being in this moment in time is like. A successful snow globe would be absurdist humor combined with a real human condition. I think people find their globes very interesting. They, they love them. They absorb you and they allow the viewer to be immersed, even for just a few seconds, in a completely different world. My name's Tim Doucet. I'm an amateur astronomer. And I'm also legally blind. Kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? It turns out, I can actually see the night sky better than most people. Probably better than you. When I was younger, um, it's, it's easy to become discouraged. You know, realizing that you're never going to drive a car, uh, that you'll never be an astronaut. At least that's what you're told. I was born with congenital cataracts. They removed the lenses of my eyes and widened my pupils. That left me with only about 10% of my eyesight. For the average person, their pupil automatically adjusts for the amount of light coming in. It opens and closes. But for me, my pupil is open, so it's always letting in a lot of light. During the day, I see everything extremely bright. Everything is overexposed. Colors are, are more vivid. But at nighttime, the tables are turned, and it's like a curtain has been lifted. When I was a teenager, I went on some additional surgery to improve my eyesight. I got home from the hospital, and I looked up at the sky, and at first I thought I was actually having a detached retina. I was seeing millions of spots of light and realized that that was the Milky Way I was looking at. And it was uh, phenomenal. At first I didn't really realize what it had given me. And it took 15 years later to realize that what I had was special. With my personal savings, I built an observatory on a hill near my house and called it Deep Sky Eye. When I'm looking through a telescope, I'm not wearing my glasses and my eye is like a camera without a lens. So it's focusing the light very clearly onto my retina. I see a little bit extra light that you know, most people wouldn't see. You know, you look at the Orion Nebula and you know, it looks like a fuzzy patch, but you know, I kind of get a little bit of purplish tinge to it. The sky here is like a tapestry of interstellar dust. It looks like a velvet background, you know, with 
diamonds all through it. It's absolutely amazing. My wife is also legally blind. She doesn't see very well at night, but most of the time when we're, you know, walking or at the observatory, I'll explain to my wife what I'm seeing. She appreciates the night sky, even though she doesn't see it very well. When I look through the telescope or look up at the night sky, it makes you realize really that all your problems with the fact that you're legally blind or, or whatever, it, it really just doesn't matter. You realize that you're a part of this universe.